<clears throat> Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar in the BioExcel webinar series. Um, my name is Adam Carter, I'll be the, the host for today. Uh, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction, just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about BioExcel uh, and our speaker today, Raffaello Potestio, and then uh, I'll hand over to Raffaello for his presentation today. Just a quick note to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. It will go up later on YouTube. Um, so uh, that includes the question and answer session at the end. So I'm sure many of you will now be aware of what BioExcel is doing. So we're a center of excellence, been around for over two years now. Um, a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research, which is built around three main pillars. Uh, the first is the biomolecular software that we're working with. Um, three codes in particular in this round of the project, Gromax, Haddock and CPMD. And we're working to improve the performance, efficiency and scalability of these uh, codes that are, are widely used in the community. A second important part of what we're doing in the project is the idea of usability. So as well as improving the codes in terms of what they do and how fast they do it, we want to make sure that they can all be used easily. And so part of the project is looking at workflow environments and with data integration and different ways that it can be easier to use these three tools and also other biomolecular research tools. And the final part of what we do is consultancy and training. And um, the webinars, to some extent, falls into to this part of what we do. Uh, so we are promoting best practices and we're training end users and we're trying to let people know about what's going on in, in, this, uh, in this community. As part of what we're doing, we have a number of interest groups. So uh, if you've not already joined, uh, then you may find that at least one of these interest groups might be of interest to you. Particularly if you're, you're here, it suggests that uh, your interests coincide with at least one of these interest groups already. So do have a look at our web pages, bioexcel.eu, and you can sign up to an interest group from there. Um, as we go through today's webinar, uh, we will probably run all the way through um, and save the questions till the end. It just makes it easier rather than trying to, to hand backwards and forwards. Um, so, but we will leave time at the end of the presentation for, for some questions. So if you do have a question, you can type it into the, um, into the question uh, session uh, section at the side and go to webinar and I'll come to you at the end. If you've got a microphone and you want to ask your question directly, I'll invite you to, to ask the, the speaker directly. If you'd prefer that I can uh, read out the question that you've typed in and, and pass it on to the, the speaker. So uh, I'll put that slide up at the end again to remind you, but that's, uh, the, that's the way we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so I'm now shortly going to hand over to Raffaello Potestio. He's a researcher in the physics department at the University of Trento. He graduated originally from the University of Rome La Sapienza in 2006 with his master's thesis on lattice quantum chromodynamics under the supervision of Martinelli. And in 2010, he defended his PhD thesis on coarse grain models of protein structure interactions and was supervised by Nicoletti. Um, he then joined Kramer's group at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in, in Mainz. Um, and uh, in August 2013, he became the project leader of the Statistical Mechanics of Biomolecules group. More recently, he was awarded an ERC starting grant for the Variamols project on the development and application of variable resolution modeling strategies to the computational study of large biomolecules. Um, this project is underway at the University of Trento, uh, where he's enrolled as a tenure track assistant professor. His main research interest is in the development and application of coarse grain models and coarse graining strategies for soft matter, and in particular, with those <coughs> biologically relevant systems. The goals of his approach are to understand the most fundamental or universal features of a system and to improve the computational efficiency of the simulations. He works uh, also on the study of topologically self-entangled biopolymers, so things like uh, knotted proteins and DNA. And um, he makes use of both standard and ad hoc coarse grain methods developed specifically for these systems. 
So as you can tell, Raffaello is uh, well placed to give today's webinar. And so I will now uh, hand over the baton to Raffaello and uh, he should be able to start uh, making his presentation from here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Adam, for your very kind presentation. I hope everything is going fine and everyone is capable of looking at the slides. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and tell you something about the work that I mainly carried out uh, in my uh, years at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research. Most of the stuff that I will present today has been carried out in that context. And here is uh, the sorry, here is a list of the topics I will I will touch. First of all, I will go through <clears throat> the basic concept of multi-scale uh, problems and simulations, especially in a biophysical and biochemical context. Then I will discuss how these problems are, ta are tackled by means of modeling uh, based on coarse-grained methods. And then I will move towards the core of the uh, presentation that is dual resolution models of liquids first. And I will focus on two uh, methodologies that have been developed in uh, in our group in minds, the address method and the H address method. I will go through that thoroughly and then I will discuss also their applications in particular for uh, simulations of uh, proteins. And then I will discuss uh, something like the dual resolution simulation, the dual resolution models of proteins and not of the liquids in which proteins uh, are, are to be found. And then I will uh, draw some conclusions and uh, think about some perspectives for this kind of uh, of research. Uh, I would like to start with a cartoon that gives an idea, an intuitive feeling for, for multi-scale problems in biology in a maybe dramatic manner, but what I like of this picture is the fact that it conveys the idea of similar, if not the same thing, happening at different levels of resolution or, um, uh, or detail uh, and size, scale, size and time scale uh, that you might look at. Uh, here, the same, pre pretty much the same thing happens at the different levels. Obviously, uh, in biological and biophysical problems, not the same thing happens uh, at all different levels, but what, what is interesting is the fact that all these levels are interconnected, and this is uh, what makes uh, these kind of problems at the same time in interesting, very much interesting, and very much challenging. Regarding the systems that we, uh, that we focus on, we are in the very low uh, region of this, uh, uh, let's call it diagram, that is, we'll focus on, uh, on molecules, biomolecules, and at most macromolecular assemblies. So let's say uh, up to the size of a viral capsid. On a more uh, formal and pragmatic manner, when we talk about uh, multi-scale problems, uh, we discuss, we think about the fact that um, the, phenomena that take place in uh, soft and biological matter and the sizes and time scales that uh, uh, in, into which these phenomena take place are smeared over a very broad range of length and time scales. This goes from the very small, like the, uh, the phenomena that take place at an atomic level or a molecular level where the molecules are, for example, a water molecule with its vibrations and um, <clears throat> and rotations and so on and so forth. And here, uh, in order to understand what goes on, we had to take explicitly into account the uh, quantum nature of a system like that. If we increase the, uh, the, the range of what we look at, we go to the size of uh, complex molecules with several atoms, tens, hundreds, thousands, composed uh, molecules composed by this large number of, uh, of atoms, whose uh, interesting behavior can be uh, described in terms of, uh, in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, in, in terms of um, uh, classical, atomistic but classical force fields. And the larger we go, uh, the coarser typically this uh, becomes the description that we have to employ to, uh, to deal with these systems. And deal means typically to perform a simulation of these kind of systems. And the different uh, levels at which we look determine at the same time the properties that we are interested in and the tool that we have to employ, again, at the, typically the computational level, 
to, uh, to study the system. If I want to study the vibrational spectrum of a molecule, I have to look at a very small length and time scale and make use of methods that take into account the explicit quantum uh, properties of the, uh, of the forces that, from which this spectrum emerges. If I go at the other end of the, of the diagram, if I, if I want to look, for example, at the uh, large scale conformation of fluctuations of an entire virus, it is clear that I cannot provide a quantum description of the, of the system, rather a fairly coarse grained uh, model uh, is definitely more appropriate and, uh, and it is the right one to get that particular level of detail. However, many uh, problems uh, are interconnected in the sense that the phenomena that we might be interested in might require a high level of detail, so a very fine-grained description of our system, and yet the system is particularly large. This represents a problem because, of course, as in this particular example, which is not recent, it's 12 years old, but uh, things have improved since then, but still we face similar problems. Uh, we would like to understand, for example, at the atomic level, at the atomistic level, the properties, the uh, mechanics, the dynamics of a system as complex as a virus uh, with the complexity given by the number of atoms, but the diversity of the molecules which are involved, that is, the proteins that constitute the viral capsid, the DNA or RNA that is inside, the water and the ions that uh, permeate completely the system. And uh, yet, the size of the system is that of a system that is better described uh, from our point of view, from our perspective, and desiderata from the point of view of, um, by means of a coarse grain model. So at the same time, we have the desire to know how the system works in detail, in atomistic detail, and yet the computational resources are such that uh, the, uh, the most, the ideal tool, the ideal description to use to describe a system like that would be a coarse grained one. There are several reasons why we would like to use a simplified representation for a system like that. The first one and most obvious is the one that I just mentioned, that is the fact that a lot of atoms and a lot of forces to compute means that we need large computers, uh, a, long, uh, a large amount of time to perform simulations. We need to, uh, we need to have large important computational resources. Then another, another interesting point that from my perspective is typically overlooked is the fact that a model that is a simplified description of a system provides important, useful information about the system already at the modeling stage. Uh, putting it in a very simple manner, you could say that if you perform, a, if you set up a model of, this, of your system that is a simplified representation of it, and it works, meaning that it is capable of providing uh, quantitatively and qualitatively correct information, it means that you have selected the right input for the system. Of course, rubbish in, rubbish out. And you might even get the right response for the wrong reasons. But typically, if you've set up a model that works, this means that you have selected the important features for the particular uh, property or phenomenon you were interested in. And this tells you a lot about the system because it means that you have gotten the essence of it. And finally, if you have a relatively cheap uh, model from the computational point of view, you can do something like an, like an exploration of the parameter space that means that you can run not one but many simulations simultaneously and what you can do is for example figure out what kind of uh, uh, what kind of responses the system has in different conditions of temperature of uh, uh, pH or whatever other uh, external knob, knob, knob you might want to, to turn. Again uh, Modeling is a source of insight as it, in itself, as I mentioned, because uh, setting up a system that is uh, simple and works means that you have gotten the right uh, ingredients, but you can also look at, the, uh, uh, at this process from the other end. That is the fact that a simplified description allows us to deal with a relatively smaller, with a fairly smaller possibly, number of um, amount of data uh, to analyze, and this helps from the practical point of view, in, from the point of view of the uh, uh, storage and uh, analysis of the data and the interpretation 
of the uh, of the data themselves. So focusing on the uh, on the aspect of coarse graining, uh, several approaches have been developed to uh, to deal with uh, complex systems uh, in in soft matter. Uh, coarse grain methods can be, for example, top down in, in the sense that uh, some specific information that you have a priori on your system or at, the, uh, at the level of the final uh, level of um, information you are interested in is available. So, for example, the structure of a protein. And this information is employed to build the model at the level of the fundamental interactions that constitute that. What does this mean? This means that, for example, you can construct protein models like elastic network models in which you start from the structure and construct the interactions based on that in order to uh, characterize the conformation of fluctuations of the, of the model. These interactions are not the real interactions that you have on, among the atoms or uh, residues in the system, they come from the structure itself. They're not transferable, they're not the real ones, so to speak, but they allow, allow you to perform simulations or calculations that provide interesting, useful information. Go models proceed in a similar manner, even though they are uh, used for, uh, typically for different things like, uh, like folding, and they also rely on the existence, on the knowledge of a structure in order to uh, determine the interactions. And based on the interactions, study uh, the process of folding, for example. <coughs> Sorry. In the opposite direction, go uh, bottom-up approaches or systematic coarse graining, as it, as it is called, in which basically you have already a fine-grained model of your system, be that, for example, a fully atomistic representation, and you want to construct a coarse grain model based on an algorithmic procedure in which you have a well-defined set of rules that you have to follow to go from a fine grain to a coarse grain level of description. What you have to do is to start from a mapping function that tells you which atoms have to be uh, employed to construct a, uh, an effective interaction center and how. Then you have to provide a criterion that tells you what your model has to do in order to be considered to, to work nicely. So for example, uh, it has to, uh, to sample the conformational space according to the same distribution that the, uh, the fine-grained system would. And then you have to provide some rule to uh, some target for the interactions, like, for example, the multibody potential of new force. The big problem in this kind of area is to approximate the multibody potential of new force. Several methods have been developed to do that. These are only three, like iterative Boltzmann inversion, multi-scale coarse graining or force matching, and relative entropy are among those that are more commonly used to perform, uh, to perform a systematic coarse graining. And then comes the problem, that is the fact that typically you do not have the chance of separating neatly the different levels of resolutions, and therefore you cannot represent the whole system one way or another with one coarse graining method or the other, because the length and time scales are interconnected. Typical example, an enzyme whose size makes it uh, reasonably good to be treated at the coarse grain level, but it has the active site in which the chemistry goes on, and this uh, chemistry requires a fairly high level of description, which, ha which has to be at least an atomistic one, if not a quantum one. You would like to describe the whole thing at the coarse grain level, yet you cannot because coarse graining smears out the level of detail and washes away the chemistry that is important for the active site. <clears throat> in order to tackle with this particular kind of problems, different methods have been developed that are concurrent or, and or multi-resolution. What does this mean? It means that there are at least some cases in which you can provide a different description of your system with different levels of resolution depending on the position that a certain part of the system occupies or depending on the role that different parts of the system, of the system play. Uh, these kind of approaches are differently developed and applied depending on the uh, particu particular properties of the system, mainly to be divided in uh, diffusive systems like liquids or gases and, so to speak, static uh, systems like, um, like a protein. In the first case, 
it is clear that uh, the problem exists of allowing molecules to diffuse back and forth uh, in the two regions that you define to be the ones at the high level of description and the one at the low level of description. So you decide that a sub part of your system can and should be described at, with a high level of resolution, for example, atomistic. The rest can and should be described at a cost grand level. And uh, you provide a geometric separation between these two parts and allow molecules to diffuse back and forth in these two regions. And the fundamental idea, as we see, is that these molecules that cross the boundary between these two domains have to change their resolution on the fly. This is not the case in systems like proteins, where you can decide that a certain group of atoms or a certain group of amino acids has to be treated at the Cosmian level and the rest has to be treated at the high resolution level. The second part typically being the smallest one and the chemically active one or the interesting one at least. So starting with liquids, the method to tackle this problem that has been developed in, uh, in the theory group of the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research quite some time ago is the adaptive resolution simulation scheme, the address method. This method is as simple as it gets in the sense that what it does is to, uh, in, is to define the resolution that a molecule is supposed to have depending on uh, its position based on a function that is either zero or one. It is zero in the low resolution, resolution or cosmic region. It is one in the atomistic or high resolution region. And it smoothly goes from one to zero in a layer that is called hybrid region that allows a smooth transition in the resolution. As you can imagine, this is relevant because of uh, the need to avoid uh, forces that would uh, jump in changing model from one to the other. In fully in the atomistic region or in the Cosgrain region, things are easy because you have molecules interacting either with the atomistic or the Cosgrain uh, potentials. Problems occur, of course, when at least one molecule is in the hybrid region. What do you do in that case? How do you allow, do you allow molecules to change resolution? This is done by mixing the forces acting between a pair of molecules uh, that can be either uh, atomistic or coarse grained or a combination of the two, a linear combination of the two, and the weights that determine the, uh, the character of the molecule, the mixed character of the, of the interaction between the two molecules, uh, are given by the product or one minus the product of the uh, resolutions of the two molecules. In this way, if both molecules are in the atomistic region, the forces are fully atomistic. In their, if they're both in the cosmic region, the interaction is purely cause grained and of course you have uh, the whole spectrum of cases if at least one molecule is in the hybrid region. Uh, this method has been thoroughly applied in uh, many cases. I would like to uh, mention just one application uh, in which I'm, I was not involved, uh, but it is a, a very nice one that I would like to mention, that is to, uh, to employ, uh, to, to mimic a quasi grand canonical simulation. Essentially, this work by the Bashish Mukherjee and Kurt Kramer uh, tackled the problem of uh, systems uh, whose size has an important effect on properties related to the free energy, the solvation free energies of the, of the liquid. And uh, essentially, what was possible to do by means of the adaptive resolution simulation method was to reduce the size uh, of the simulation box uh, to a uh, fairly uh, fairly small uh, number of molecules, making use of the fact that in the cosgrain region uh, that you see here, the molecules are uh, interact through a very smooth potential, a like cosgrain potential, and can be exchanged in time. So essentially a water molecule can become uh, a methanol molecule or vice versa. And what happens is that you can change the uh, instantaneous relative concentration of the two chemical species uh, by means of a Monte Carlo uh, algorithm in order to keep the uh, relative density of the two species constant irrespectively of what happens into the high resolution region uh, where something happens because um, because uh, a molecule a polymer the nipam uh, absorbs the solute thereby changing its concentration with this trick it is possible to, uh, to change the uh, relative concentration of molecules. And this is something that you cannot do easily if the whole system is atomistic, because 
the forces are much stronger, the energy landscapes or the energy landscapes are much rougher, and because of that, the um, uh, interactions are the forces that come out uh, are are higher, and the acceptance rate are lower. So the address method is uh, very simple, very effective, and it allows to do essentially what you want to do. However, uh, it has some limitations. So as I said, it is a very simple strategy. It satisfies Newton's third law because it, by construction, has an anti-symmetric construction of the force. Its force, does, its force doesn't con contain any derivative of the switching function, and this is, of course, done by construction because the interpolation is performed at the level of the uh, forces themselves. However, no Hamiltonian formulation exists because it can be proven that this force field is not uh, cannot be derived from a from a fully Hamiltonian from a full Hamiltonian. Therefore, the uh, force field is non-conservative. A local thermostat is required in order to have stable simulations. And again, the absence of a Hamiltonian implies the impossibility to perform energy conserving or Monte Carlo simulations or to write down the partition function of the system that for, for some particular theoretical uh, studies, it might be necessary. So the question is whether a Hamiltonian formulation is viable. And the answer is yes. We uh, worked together with our colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research and also others, we worked on the definition of a Hamiltonian that is, as you see here, where the interactions are weighted uh, through the resolution of a molecule directly at the level of uh, potentials and not forces. The uh, terms that you see here, this V, A, A, or C, G, are essentially related to the sum of all interactions of one type or the other that a certain molecule has with all the other molecules in its interaction range, range appropriately weighted in order to have uh, correct normalization. And this Hamiltonian generates forces that look like this. The first part is related to the internal forces within a molecule, and this doesn't change with respect to the resolution. The rest is essentially identical, it's very similar to what one has in the uh, address method, if not for the fact that the uh, weight is given by the average and not the product of the resolutions. And then you have this particular term that is related to the gradient of the switching function. Now, this is something that is uh, a bit tedious because you have a force that acts only in the hybrid region because the gradient of lambda is uh, non-zero only in the hybrid region and pushes molecules here and there depending on the, uh, on the relative sign, on the sign of this, uh, these two terms. So the question is how to deal with this particular term that one would like to, to eliminate. If we look at what happens in a, uh, in a simulation, in particular in, a, uh, in the hybrid region of a H address simulation, we concentrate on a molecule at position R with resolution lambda, and we ask ourselves what happens to the uh, average of the drift force, or what we call the drift force. What happens is that this term, uh, if you constrain the, er, the position of the molecule and average over, uh, over the force, of course you average only on the difference between the two potentials because the rest is, is constant, uh, you realize that this term is related to, can be related to, the gradient of Helmholtz free energy uh, as a function of the resolution and uh, it is related to the free energy difference between the two models that you have, the atomistic one and the corresponding one. So it tells you that essentially the force that you see in the hybrid region is related to the free energy change that you have in going from one domain to the other, from one model to the other. So in order to eliminate that, what you can do is to modify the Hamiltonian in order to introduce a compensating term, which is, as a first approximation, given by the uh, free energy difference uh, between the two domains as a function of the resolution, so at delta f of lambda, which can be computed by means of a, uh, a thermodynamic integration. And introducing this term, you can, on average, remove the drift force without having to disrupt the Hamiltonian character of the, uh, of the system. If you, on top of that, include a term that is related to the difference in pressure between the two models at a certain uh, state point, so con conditions of temperature and density, what you obtain is that you flatten uniformly 
the density throughout the system. I will, will not go into the details about that. I will be happy to take questions about this. But essentially, what happens is that if you include a term that compensates for the difference in chemical potential between the two domains as a function of the resolution, that is as a function of the position, you obtain a system, uh, a liquid, which has a dual resolution and a uniform density profile. Now, in, uh, in qualitative terms, what happens is that you, the, the two models that you have in the system follow two different equations of state, the one for the atomistic model and the one for the Cosmic model. When you put the two together, the, the two parts of the system go in different points of these uh, two equations. If you correct for the, for the, uh, for the drift force, you obtain, you go into a condition in which you have the same pressure for the two uh, regions, but a different density. If you include a term so as to have the chemical potential difference in the correction term, you obtain different pressures for the same density. And the different pressures are the ones for which each system has separately that particular density at that value of the temperature. Okay. Uh, I will very briefly go through a particular application of this methodology that is uh, the coupling of a classical and a quantum representation of molecules. Quantum means here delocalization, so no, no elections taken into account, just uh, the delocalization uh, effects due to uh, the quantum nature of, uh, of molecules, especially for very light molecules like hydrogen atoms or molecules. This is relevant. What I just want to say is that <clears throat> Sorry, what you can do is to couple different representations of the, uh, of the same system, a quantum one and a classical one, by means of this uh, Hamiltonian based approach, and have the, uh, the system described appropriately with the same density and the uh, same level, the appropriate level of quantumness throughout the different uh, regions. Recently, this approach was extended from the static regimes of Monte Carlo simulations to the dynamics regime, and it is possible to perform uh, quantum classical simulations with, uh, with the ring polymers in the high resolution domain so as to calculate dynamical properties uh, in, at the quantum level. Another interesting uh, application of adaptive resolution methods in general, in this particular case of H address, is the coupling with an ideal gas. This coupling is particularly relevant because the computational cost of an ideal gas is practically zero. Here, by ideal gas, what I mean is that the molecules that find themselves in the Cosgrain region have no interaction, feel no interaction but the thermostat. So what happens is that you just evolve the dynamics of your, uh, of your molecules in the Cosgrain region through the Langevin thermostat, and no other interaction is taken into account. However, even at strongly interacting liquid like water is, is described within the high resolution domain with the appropriate uh, at the appropriate level with the uh, with the correct thermodynamics and all the structural and some equilibrium dynamical properties are reproduced correctly so here you see radial dis distribution functions diffusion profiles uh, as a function of time and also the uh, fluctuations in the number of molecules that are in the atomistic region, the ones that you would expect in a fully atomistic simulation. And of course, it deviates strongly as you go into the uh, coarse grain ideal gas region. As I mentioned, the computational cost is remarkable, is remarkably reduced because eventually, if you increase the size of the simulation box, keeping the atomistic region fixed in size, what you get is a linear gain in, um, uh, in the speed up meaning that essentially you can increase as much as you want the uh, size of the cause grain domain of the ideal gas domain but the computational cost will be completely dominated by the atomistic part so essentially what you perform is the simulation of the is a simulation of a system with a large reservoir of particles at the cost of what you have only in the atomistic plus hybrid region at an extreme uh, case you can think of solvating a very large box at the atomistic level for with a number of molecules in the hundreds of thousands uh, that corresponds to the size of, a, of an entire virus completely solvated and increase the size of the simulation box 
in the Cosgrain domain, and what you would get is a speed up that increases with the size of the simulation box if you keep the size of the optimistic region fixed. Now, this is a nice technical uh, instrument, but from the practical point of view, how can you uh, use it, especially in the context of uh, biological simulations? The first and most obvious thing to do is to uh, take a protein, solvate it into water, and treat the solvent itself uh, in dual resolution. There is the computational advantage that one gets from that. For small systems, this is not a particularly large computational advantage. Uh, definitely more interesting uh, way of using it is to understand what kind of correlations you have in the system. So what you can do is to change the size of the atomistic region. In particular, you can decrease the volume, the radius of this sphere uh, that solvates the system and investigate some properties of the, uh, of the system, like the num number of hydrogen bonds that you have at the uh, at the interface between protein and water, or uh, calculate with mean square fluctuations, sub-correlation uh, times of the velocities of water molecules at the surface of the, uh, of the protein, and see at which point you begin to uh, poke into these properties and change their value. And in this way, you can try to understand what is the correlation length between the water at the surface of the protein and the water in the bulk, and by this you can provide a sort of uh, operational uh, description and operational value of the uh, solvation uh, shell, the thickness of the solvation shell of your system. If you do it like this with a Cosgrain model uh, that is an interacting one, so not the ideal gas, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's an IBI Cosgrain model, you see that essentially it is sufficient to have a 1.3 nanometer thick water layer uh, starting from the radius of duration of the molecule in order to have uh, these values correctly reproduced uh, with respect to a fully atomistic simulation. And this is interesting because it tells you how much uh, coupling exists between the water at the uh, surface of the protein and the water in the bulk, not from all points of view, but in particular from the point of view of the internal degrees of freedom. Because the water molecules uh, that exist in the system can freely diffuse back and forth and the thermodynamics of the system is correctly reproduced everywhere. What, what is lost as you go away from the atomistic into the cosmic region is the internal uh, degrees of freedom of the molecule. So the, uh, the structure of water is lost in a gradual, in a, in a smooth way. And in, uh, in measuring at which point you can place this decoupling allows you to understand what is the strength, how, how, uh, how the interaction between these internal degrees of freedom penetrates into the bulk of, the, uh, of water. This simulation has been performed by means of the uh, adaptive resolution simulation scheme, so the force-based address scheme. The same setup can be uh, implemented uh, in the um, with the Hamiltonian scheme, and this is what uh, we did recently in the group of uh, Paolo Carloni. And uh, we performed simulations of, uh, of proteins in dual resolution water, uh, in which the Hamiltonian adaptive resolution, uh, uh, adaptive resolution simulation scheme has been employed, implemented in uh, an in-house version of GROMAX. Uh, Vania Calandrini has recently uh, uh, given a webinar in the BioXL context uh, precisely on this kind of work, not only but also discussing this kind of work. And uh, I invite you to go uh, look into that if you want more details about, the, about these things. Finally, regarding this uh, aspect of uh, dual resolution simulations of liquids, I would like to mention the fact that the uh, separation between the geometrical separation between high resolution and low resolution description can be made flexible, has been made flexible, uh, and in such a way as to change, to adapt the shape of the high resolution region to the shape of a particular solute. This is especially important in the case of uh, protein folding, for example, because you can start from a setup in which the protein 
is, uh, is completely swollen, in which the, the peptide chain is uh, open and uh, extended, and it, and it has a certain conformation. And as it falls, it collapses, thereby reducing the amount of solvent that is required to be treated at the atomistic level. And by adapting the shape of the high resolution region based on the shape of the solute itself, you can keep the amount of high resolution solvent really at the minimum. This is done essentially by combining uh, many high resolution regions of spherical shape, each centered on an atom of the, uh, of the solute, which merge in, a, uh, in the appropriate manner so as to provide a flexible description of the, um, of the high resolution uh, domain in its, all, in, in its full glory. And uh, obviously it was tested that this uh, setup doesn't have negative impacts on the, uh, on the properties of the system, like for example, uh, the, the free energy landscape of certain particular degrees of freedom. Moving from the liquids to the structure of the proteins, as I mentioned, the uh, possibility can be envisaged of modeling the same system, so a given protein, for example, with two different models. A very simple model, an elastic network model, for example, can be appropriate to describe the conformation of fluctuations of a protein, so the large scale, the, not, not the large amplitude, but the large scale uh, collective motions that are uh, the most characteristic of a globular protein and the ones that are functionally related, functionally oriented. However, it lacks the chemistry uh, that is necessary to be present in the active site. So ideally, you could uh, put together the uh, atomistic description of the, uh, of the active site with a coarse grain representation of the, uh, of the rest of the protein that is parameterized appropriately so as to reproduce the conformation of fluctuations of, the, um, of some reference data. So for example, experiments or uh, simulations or both. And of course, you have to check that these uh, properties, these collective properties are correctly reproduced by the dual resolution, uh, dual resolution system. This is relatively easy to do, but of course, uh, what well, the let's say the uh, the challenge lies in what happens into the active site the active site in this particular uh, model in the in the work that we did uh, was treated um, at the uh, at the atomistic level not only as far as the protein is concerned but also regarding the water so that we uh, used address to provide to solvate the active site with uh, with atomistic water while the rest of water molecules that are not represented for clarity in this image are treated at the cause grain level. And then of course it is necessary to validate this approach in such a way as to uh, be sure that all the chemical and biochemical properties uh, of interest are correctly reproduced in the dual resolution uh, model. So you can look at the distance distributions or uh, for example the electro electrostatics of the system which is of course particularly relevant in the in, in, in the case of uh, proteins and in particular for the uh, in, in the active site uh, of enzymes. Um, what is relevant, uh, what is uh, important in this model is not only that it can just reproduce uh, what happens in this uh, and with respect to a fully atomistic simulation, this is of course the basics, but uh, this is not just for this that you do that, you might want to get something more out of a system like this. And more means that you can uh, perform, you can save time in the simulation and perform, for example, free energy calculations uh, in, in a batch so that you have cheaper simulations to perform. Therefore, the possibility of running more simulations with the same computational resources. And this means that, for example, you can calculate the binding free energies of different uh, substrates on the same uh, enzyme with a reduced amount of computational resources. Together with that, you also have the possibility of uh, employing this tool in order to figure out uh, what are the important, so to speak, residues of the active site. So what happens to the binding free energies if I describe the active site at the atomistic level using a certain number of residues or another number of residues? If I add or remove residues from uh, the active site? How does the 
uh, binding free energy changes. This is a fairly large set of important questions that are currently being uh, investigated by, the, by means of these kind of models. And of course, uh, the, the big goal of these approaches is precisely to go big. That is to uh, put together a setup that is computationally as cheap as possible in order to investigate systems that are large. The two approaches that I described, that is uh, dual resolution model of a protein and dual resolution adaptive resolution model of the solvent can be combined uh, with the perspective of having the most accurate description possible for the solvent so that the uh, solvated protein feels to be in a grand canonical simulation, so to speak, so that no finite size, finite size effects uh, due to the solvent uh, are present. And the protein itself is treated at the atomistic level only where necessary or where it is known, uh, because in many cases you might have to deal with proteins whose uh, structure is not completely known. And this is yet another topic that has been tackled in uh, Vania Calendrini's seminar, and I would refer you to, to that. So, uh, summing up, the adaptive resolution simulation methods are uh, interesting and important because they uh, cover and touch different uh, areas of uh, science. You can do fundamental uh, physics, fundamental statistical physics uh, with them because they allow you to uh, manipulate the system in ways that are pretty much not conventional and therefore they give you a further degrees of, degree of freedom to uh, understand uh, uh, liquids and gases. The quantum to classical coupling has been uh, an, important, uh, an important topic in, uh, in the recent work that we did, both at the level of molecules uh, whose quantumness uh, is, can be represented by means of path integrals, but also uh, as far as QMMM methods are concerned, uh, especially adaptive QMMM methods that have been developed, inspired by the Hamiltonian, <coughs> sorry, the Hamiltonian adaptive resolution simulation scheme. And finally, obviously, the simulation of biomolecules uh, in which the solvent and or the protein are treated at the uh, dual resolution level. <coughs> these softwares are implemented in, um, these methods are implemented in different softwares. The main uh, ones are the Espresso++ Plus Plus, uh, software and the LAMPS software in a uh, sort of pro pro proprietary version modified by us uh, in-house. And of course, we also have uh, a tentative uh, Gromax uh, implementation of the H address method together with the, uh, with the method developed, method, methods developed in the group of Paolo Perloni in Zurich. So to conclude, uh, a platitude, soft matter systems are intrinsically multi-scale. This means that uh, the system has to be often tackled in a holistic manner, if you allow me the, uh, the expression. Coarse grain models are fundamental to understand uh, these uh, biological systems, but they are limited in that they smear, they uh, decrease the resolution in a uniform manner, and this is often not sufficient. Because of that, it is important to go towards uh, methods that put together different approaches in the same simulation setup. With this, I would like to conclude thanking uh, all the people who have been involved in, uh, in this work, <coughs> especially uh, my former group in Mainz. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the funding that came from the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research, the German Physical Society, the German uh, Research Foundation, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics, and the ERC, uh, uh, the ERC, especially this last part as far as the project that funds me at the moment is concerned, in which we will work precisely on the development of methods for the uh, simulation, for the modeling and simulation of systems at different levels of, uh, of resolution. With this, I conclude and I switch to uh, the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Raffaello. Uh, thanks very much for that very interesting talk. Um, so we already have a couple of questions that I can see uh, in the questions section. So um, uh, in a moment, I will come to, to each person in turn. Uh, I will. 
from your microphone and, and you can ask your question directly if you want to. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, read it out from the, the chat window. Um, incidentally, if you're watching this recording later on YouTube or the BioXL website, you can also ask a, a question in the Ask BioXL web forum and we'll try and make sure that that is, is followed up for you and, and answered there. So um, I'm going to start then by taking a question from Amin. I mean, I'm going to try and unmute your microphone and, and let you speak if you want to. Uh, let me just try. Okay, Amin, would you like to answer your question directly? Otherwise, if you can't do that, uh, I will read it out. Okay, I'm not hearing from uh, Amin, so uh, let me read out the question. Um, so the question that was asked was, um, sorry, my question is not opening up in front of me, just a second. Okay, here we go. Uh, the question is, the first question was, is there a modified version of Gromax with address available to download? Um, so I think you touched on that at the end. That, um, that there is there is work going on in Gromax. Can you comment on what what stage yes. that's at and what it can actually do? Yeah. Yes. So uh, at first there was a, um, there was a version of address, so the force based method implemented in Gromax and actually available uh, within the distribution of Gromax. However, it was dismissed uh, after a few after a few years. However, uh, so I think that it is still possible to have uh, to have the address uh, version of Gromax if one looks at the previous versions. Uh, there is also a description of the method and how to use it into the manual. However, this is not maintained anymore, as far as I know. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. But uh, as far as I know, there is no current implementation uh, in the latest version of Gromax. In the previous ones, you can find them. Regarding the, um, the H address method, uh, what we have is a relatively hacky implementation of the method because uh, it had to, uh, to, mm, we had to merge both the dual resolution protein model from the group of Paolo Carloni and the uh, H address method that we had already implemented in, the, uh, in Romax starting from the implementation of address. Uh, it is definitely our interest to make this uh, this merged uh, Gromax version containing both methods uh, as neat as possible and uh, obviously available. And I think that within the BioXL um, framework, this is uh, something that is currently uh, dealt with. Okay, thank you. And there was a follow-on question as well, um, which I think is separate. <laughs> The following question was, are there adaptive resolution methods available to perform steered molecular dynamic simulations like pooling, unfolding, et cetera, to compare with atomic force microscopy experiments? The, the methods as they are implemented in Espresso++ and in LAMPS are uh, certainly more than prone, let me say that, uh, for these kind of problems. Uh, I say more than prone instead of perfectly ready for, because it might really depend on what you are interested in. Because, so the, for example, in LAMPS, we are currently, um, we are currently using LAMPS and H address to perform, um, to perform umbrella sampling. So essentially we have uh, restraints uh, and uh, restraints and constraints and, uh, and hand sampling methods like this, which are used uh, seamlessly without any problem. So it was our interest to implement H address in LAMPS in such a way that the largest compatibility with everything else that is already available in LAMPS uh, can, be, can be granted. So I would say if you want to perform uh, uh, steered molecular dynamics, for example, on a protein, so pooling, if I understood correctly, uh, this could be something uh, the, the question was referred to. If you want to, to perform a pooling experiment on, on a protein, uh, which is treated, uh, in, which is immersed in a dual resolution solvent, so to speak, I think this is something that you can uh, do with no problems, both in Espresso++ and in LAMPS. Okay, 
Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. I mean, if not, or if you have a follow on, do just type in uh, and we can, we can find out more. Um, I have the next question uh, from uh, Alberto de Pietri, who asks, um, regarding the capability of adaptive resolution schemes to reduce the computational cost of full atom simulations, could you provide some numbers or quantitative examples? Um, yes. So I think this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very, that's a very relevant question. The, uh, of course, one, one of the main reasons why we do that is to save time in computer simulations. Uh, the, uh, the hard wall against uh, which you, 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 you break your head is the cost of the uh, high resolution part, the computational cost of the high resolution part. Essentially, in the best case scenario, as it is, for example, the ideal gas, the solvent you have, the, uh, the cost of the simulation of the solvent you have is completely given by the, uh, the atomistic and hybrid region where you have to compute atomistic forces. So the, uh, the best, the, the, the speed up that you get is essentially given by the volume of your simulation box divided by the volume of the atomistic plus uh, hybrid region. The larger the system with respect to the high resolution part, the larger the speed up that you get. This is essentially the, um, uh, the essence. This is the essence of the uh, slide that I presented with the, uh, with the simulation of the huge water bubble as large as a, a viral capsid uh, immersed in the ideal gas. Additionally, the, the more complex your solvent is, the better. Because, of course, if you have a very complex solvent, if you have a very complex molecule, a liquid composed by a very complex molecule, you have many forces to compute. And this goes to nothing or very little in the coarse grain region. Naturally, there is a limit to that. There is a limit in the gain uh, that you get from that. And this limit is given by the fact that you cannot go below the uh, amount of calculations that you have to do in the uh, in the Cosmian region. So the reason why one has to go big in order to exploit at the best these kind of approaches is the fact that for very large systems you can employ an, an, an arbitrarily large reservoir of molecules and yet have the solvated part uh, very small. And by very small I do not mean in absolute terms but just relative to the total volume of the simulation. So you can have a fairly large amount of water or whatever solvent that is treated at the atomistic level. However, the rest would be immensely larger and that costs nothing in the simulation if you have a very cheap um, model. Uh, a side remark, of course, there is a component given by the, um, uh, by the workload distribution in a, a multi-core simulation. So if you can parallelize uh, your simulation and break into pieces the, uh, the atomistic region in a, in a meaningful way, which means that it has to be large enough, uh, then you can reduce the computational cost uh, further because you can reduce essentially, uh, you, can, you can distribute the calculation of the high resolution part uh, among different cores. If it is large enough, you, you can take advantage also from that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so. Both Amin and Alberto have passed on their thanks through the, the chat window for those answers. Um, we're coming nearly to the top of the hour. Um, this is your last chance to, to ask a question now directly to Raffaello. So if you do have a, a, any other questions, as your chance. You can quickly push the hand up button if you, uh, if you don't want to type the full question. Um, No, I don't think we've got any other questions from the floor today and we are coming up to the top of the hour. So uh, with that, I would like to say thank you very much indeed uh, to Raffaello for his um, presentation today. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and if anything, uh, uh, any other questions do come up, um, then do visit ask.bioexcel.eu uh, to, to ask your, your questions on the forum. Um, one final comment before we go today uh, that um, we have uh, 
our next presentation, uh, our next webinar coming up next week. Um, that's Qingdao Wang from IBM. Um, so this is a slightly different uh, angle of the, the work that BioXL is working on. So uh, I don't know if it'll directly be of interest to you, but please do spread the word. Um, so this is on CWL exec. It's a new open source tool to run uh, common workflow language workflows on LSF. So uh, this is to do with the, the, uh, the workflows aspect of BioXL. So if you're interested in that or you know somebody who might be, do pass on, do spread the word. Okay, thank you all very much for coming along today uh, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon in the next BioXL webinar. Bye.